Welcome, everybody. We are excited. Today, we are going to be talking about why your reps are not hitting quota and how they can. I'm going to introduce myself and my esteemed colleague, Mr. Ron Hollis, here in just a minute. But uh, we want to wait for just a second to let some of the stragglers come on in. Uh, so I'm going to play a short video about one of the topics we're going to be talking about today, which is our sales effectiveness quadrant, how you turn bottom performers to top performers. Watch the clip, and we'll jump on in. I'm Bill Quinn. I am a dual role of running uh, sales strategy and operations for Broadridge in addition to running all of North American sell side sales. I'm Catherine Mendoza. I'm the vice president for sales operations and reporting for Broadridge. Broadridge is about a $4 billion uh, technology and managed service organization. We support uh, predominantly financial services with both uh, back office technology solutions as well as customer communication solutions. We are based out of, out of uh, the New York area, but we have offices all over the world, including in London and Singapore, Asia, Russia. It's a very sales-driven culture. Our CEO is, is, a, is a natural sort of salesman. As a segment sales team, we are responsible for selling the full portfolio of Broadridge services. I'd say probably about a year ago, we, we were struggling with, as you think about the notion of complex sales cycles and multi-year sales cycles, I was looking constantly at sort of what I always described as lagging indicator data. How did someone do against their quota? Leveraging predictive pipeline and the tools that, that Inside Sales brings to the table was part of um, something that we looked at early on to get better at using data and driving um, data-based in decision making. Our idea was let's get better at measuring sales productivity. Now using this tool, we show the data to the sales leaders. Um, I would say 9.5 times out of 10, the sales reader. All right. I think that's good enough. Great video. If you'd like to watch more of it, you can find a link to it in your resources section. But let's jump on into the webinar. I want to make sure I've got everybody online, and I do want this to be interactive. So if you see your Q&A box down there, uh, grab it, type your name, where you're from. Feel free to ask questions, um, um, you know, well, questions, maybe not about anything you want, but ask questions relevant to the topic. Um, and then I'll introduce myself and uh, Ron here in just a second. So it looks like we got Justin. Oh, Justin, welcome, MedPro. Thank you for joining. Um, Katie, Laura, Carlos, Frank, Joshua. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you, Stephen, Megan, Ashley, Ken, Nicole. Great. Um, thank you for joining. Um, looking forward to having you. Uh, okay, so I'm Gabe Larson. I run what we call Inside Sales Lab. That's our research and best practice group here at Inside Sales. Um, and my esteemed colleague is Mr. Ron Hollis, who is a strategic consultant of sales effectiveness, uh, again, here at InsideSales.com. And he is going to be sharing some real cool stuff he's been working on. But Ron, um, can you take just a minute and introduce yourself and a little bit better about what you do here at InsideSales.com? Yeah, Gabe, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm, I'm out of Austin, uh, and I get to travel around the country and, and talk to people about um, really bringing their, you know, C and D players up to B and A players and trying to help them understand and identify where some of the problems that they're having in uh, revenue creation and building pipeline. So excited to be here. Love Thanks. It. I love it. Yep. And we're going to get into some of the meat here in just a minute. Man, we got a lot of people. Ron, Megan, Mike, Jessica, Mercedes, uh, Carson, Reagan. I saw a great name in here. Oh, David Dykstra. Man, I was thinking Lenny Dykstra. Um, I'm a big fan of Lenny Dykstra back in the Philadelphia Phillies uh, ages. That's an interesting story, but I thought I saw Lenny, but it was David David Dykstra. Um, okay, well, I'm going to jump in. Um, today, again, we're going to be talking about why your reps are not hitting quota and how they can. It's end of 2017. Hopefully, you've all had a great year. Happy holidays from the family here at Inside Sales and all we do. Um, hopefully, you'll have a great 2018. But as you prepare for 2018, a lot of sales leaders are thinking, Mm, dang it. I did okay when it came to quota attainment, 
but I wish I would have done a little bit better. I wish we would have bigger numbers, more people going to President's Club, et cetera. Now, they're not alone in that predicament. This is a study by Miller-Hyman, um, CSO. It's a group uh, of subsidiary under Miller-Hyman. They've been tracking quota attainment for a long time. I'm just showing the last decade. I think they pull it back even a, um, another five years. But what you're seeing in this trend, you guys, is real. A lot of people are struggling. In 2017, they report that only 53% of reps are achieving quota. Now, that's obviously a problem. And if you see the trend, it's not improving. Um, wow. Well, what's going on there? Why are we not hitting quota in general? And the thing we want to dive into today, and there's always, you know, don't get me wrong, there's going to be a myriad potentially of reasons depending on your company. But one of the things we've been tracking in our data is this idea around actions and behavior. And when it comes to salespeople, actions always speak louder than words. So we want to take you through some uh, behaviors that are killing companies or, or you know, really limiting companies' ability to hit quota. Um, for those of you who don't know, you ought to check this out. We did a study just in the last few months uh, where we looked at 10 million sales opportunities with Ron and his team. Um, man, I took I take that number and I show it to people, and it's like, oh my goodness, we did a survey for you know of 100 people for our research study. We just did a survey research for 10 million sales opportunities, and some really interesting things came out of it especially when it comes to quota attainment, how people are managing their pipeline. Now, what you're seeing right here is the number of deals won and lost by day of the month. And that's just looking at all of these companies, millions of opportunities. It's mm -hmm. like, look, typically throughout a given month, throughout a given quarter, it's, yeah, I mean, we lose some, we win some. Um, it's just kind of the way things work. But as you trend towards that last day of the quarter, as you trend towards that last day of the month, something extraordinary happens. You see an 11x increase in number of deals lost and a 3x increase in number of deals won. Now, some of you are going to say, yeah, I mean, that's just what happens at the end of the quarter. You know, it's kind of a fire drill. We're pulling things forward that maybe shouldn't. We're cleaning up our pipeline. Guys, nobody can tell me that an 11x increase in number of deals lost is just people cleaning up your pipeline. What you're having is some bad behaviors going on. We wait, we wait, we try to push. And it's not all sales reps. I mean, consumers are pushing this on the sales teams, and these behaviors are showing themselves. But it gets to be pretty ugly that last day. And on top of that, two other things I wanted to highlight. One is deal size. Notice what happens on that last day of the month, whether you like it or not. On average, on average, deal sizes drop by 35%. 35%. You're not. Tell me that's not bad behavior. Look me in the eye and tell me that's not bad behavior because you can't. That's that's embarrassing, and, and we're all doing it. And again, I know there's different reasons, and customers are pushing us, and sometimes we got to hit our number. And I'm not saying it's not sometimes justified, but on aggregate, you guys, that's that's bad behavior. In addition to that, and this dovetails off the win loss, the win rate becomes pretty abysmal. Um, on that last day of the month, win rates drop 51%. Your ability to close a deal is is shoddy at best. Now, with these behaviors come consequences. And the consequence of that is a 27% lift in revenue that's left on the table because we can't figure out how to manage that better. Now, again, some of it's natural and you pro probably couldn't get, if we could manage our deal size better, if we could manage our win rate better on that last couple days of the month, you have a huge potential uptick in revenue. Now, is it the full 27 cents? I know, don't get it. Some people are <laughs> I've seen some people saying, is that a guarantee on 27%? No, John. I, I mean, that's on aggregate. It's a study of millions of opportunities. But what I'm telling you is, if you're anything like the typical company, you have some bad behaviors 
and if you were able to solve those bad behaviors, you would see an uptick in revenue. That I can guarantee you, John. That, you know, I'd put my stamp on that one. So, um, got it. The question is, how do we solve some of these bad behaviors? How do we shed the light on, turn the light on in the room so that we can get to a place where we're actually being more proactive? I, I talk to leaders about that study, and they say, this is, you know, end of the year comes or end of the quarter, and I look at these lagging indicators, and I think, dang it, you know, this is where we are. I need to be more proactive, but it's hard to do that, or how do I start to manage those behaviors better? Let me give you one example of, of how another industry did it. You think about the navigational um, vertical and the evolution that's taken place as companies and individuals have kind of gone through different ways to do that. You see on the left-hand side, it's maps, right? I mean, I, <laughs> I can remember one time, you know, this is what, 15 years ago, I'm driving through Los Angeles. I'm a small town. I mean, I'm not a farm boy, but let's let's go with the analogy. I'm a small small town farm boy. I'm driving through Los Angeles. I've got a map, and it's just uh, it looks like that map. I mean, it was just mind boggling. I'm like, I thought I knew how to look at a map. I had no. Idea. I mean, it's difficult. And when it comes to sales, you can do things manual as well. Now, as we see the evolution of navigation systems, you saw Garmin come into place, and he had to load maps. It was it was terrible to update maps in Garmin. No offense if anybody from Garmin's listening, but it was a terrible process. But it was great. It, it was a nice automated mapping process. Now the world we live in is predictive, and Waze and Google and crowdsourcing data to see if you can't figure out traffic patterns and um, congestion patterns and optimal routes, as you see there. That's the world we live in, and that's where we got to go when it comes to making sure we get every rep as far to hitting quota as possible. And so there's three typical scenarios we see companies take when they sit down and say, shoot, my team didn't hit my number, or we didn't hit our quota, not enough reps hit quota. Number one, they sit down and they run it manually. They say, hey, why don't we have a chat and we'll sit down and kind of shoot shoot the bowl um, and, and just kind of chat about what you think and what I think, and it's pretty subjective. It's, it's a process. It's something people do, and it is what it is. The second option is, you know, we do try to dive in. We try to look at the CRM, and, uh, and Ron knows all about this as he's worked with companies. You know, they got some in spreadsheets. They got some in, um, you know, some BI tool, and, um, but the BI tool, you know, maybe they don't got it hooked to the web applications, uh, a little bit of CRM. So we're, we, we try to get some reporting, and then we have this conversation with sales reps and, and try to get some data behind it. The last option kind of brings the best of both worlds. It brings the individual conversation with a data or predictive data approach and, and really identifies, turns the lights on, says this is what's happening. Um, and it goes about it in a way, and I want to turn it over to, to Ron here in, in just a second, kind of the master behind the magic. Um, oh, my goodness. Are you seeing that gift on the screen, Ron? Is that doing the gift for you, Ron? Yes, it is. Thank you. Oh, man, that's great. I didn't know we had the gift in there. Uh, I love it. <laughs> so the idea on that is it takes those bottom performers, um, sheds the light on it, and then starts shoving them up. You start working through a systematic process, and, guys, it's, it's work. I mean, I'm not going to say you can just flip a, you know, flip a coin, snap a finger, but you start working at it. You actually shed some light on this, and you're able to identify what's working and what's not, and all of a sudden more people are hitting quota. And so with that, um, uh, I, I want to turn it over to, to Ron Hollis, again, strategic consultant over here at Insight Sales, working through sales effectiveness and our technology of what we call the sales effectiveness quadrant. It's an assessment we work with companies to do to identify those bottom performers and start to get a plan and process to get them from bottom to top. So Ron, I want you to dive into that and kind of help us visualize an experience how you'd run through this kind of process and what it looks like for companies. Um, over to you. All right, thanks, Gabe. Yeah, I'm glad that little animated GIF was in it. That was that was a nice surprise. Um, so to set some context, you know, kind of kind of behind that, it, it was it was uh, this notion of of trying to understand what does success look like in an organization uh, in really kind of three areas around people, processes, and opportunities. 
and you know being on the road and, and uh, you know having the opportunity to talk to a lot of sales leaders you know the one th there's there's something that pops up all the time it's like yeah we know there's a problem but they can't necessarily isolate the problem so it got me thinking oh well so identifying the problem is oftentimes the problem and you kind of net it out and that's that's the <laughs> that, that that tends to be the case and so what we did is is develop an assessment that would allow us to go and assess assess uh, an organization in in kind of two two major areas, right? It's you know the the if you ask anybody, they're going to tell you, hey, we need to build better pipeline and we need to be able to execute that pipeline and turn it into revenue. Uh, but we we need to figure out you know what's working and what's not. So this three step approach that we'll go through is kind of like defining the problem. Like we'll get we'll get into that, and, and Gabe touched on it a little bit earlier, and then we'll assess the team. Right, it's like, hey, let's uh, let's look like let's let's define what success looks like in our organization by leveraging data, because yeah. it's it's objective, right? Uh, yeah. And then let's look at how we actually take those insights, and 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 really, I think the big the you, you said it on a couple things, right? You talked about the map, and then you talked about the kind of the, the, the moving from, uh, you know, to a CRM mm -hmm. and to a more predictive thing. It's this whole notion of how do I move from just being um, what I would say providing uh, information that's, that's interesting and informative to formulating an opinion, right, based off of benchmarks uh, and, and success metrics, uh, and then even transitioning further to providing um, a prescription like what's my next action so we'll, so we'll jump into we'll jump into to that right so the first one right now, Ron, find this, the problem yeah go ahead yeah Ron sorry real quick I, I, I was neglecting some of the questions here but one that I do want to answer because I think it's very fitting right here um, you got Tom who said is this an actual assessment that reps take like do you and I, you, you may answer this just in a minute but he, he's saying do they like go through and answer a survey or when you say a rep assessment what 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 does that mean no, so that's a great question, and, and, and thanks for the question. Uh, no, it's this is a, if if you ask the reps, it's kind of um, maybe I'll, I'll draw a bad analogy, but if you go and read the book Strength Finders, right, that's a little bit of a self fulfilling prophecy because you're, you're self reporting. Uh, what we're doing is saying, hey, I want to look at the data. I want to tell me what the tell me what the data says. But if you look at any organization, you have leaders and you have laggards and you have everything in between, and you have what I call the, the, the quintessential purple squirrel, right? You can put him at McDonald's or McDonald Douglas, and he's going to be successful. That's, that, you can't build a model of success from those people, right, because they're, they're anomalies. And so you, you have to build something that's scalable that is digestible by all of the, all of the sellers. And, and that's like, you know, yeah, what, are now, the, what are the KPIs that are tied to activity? Yeah, I mean, I, I do love your talk track there, Ron, but I've got to tell you, I've got a few people. We got Dale and Tim and Mary. We got three people who wrote and said uh, they love Strength Finder, and, and, and I'm also a Strength Finder fan, so be <laughs> be a little cautious of, uh, of I'll be, I'll, I'll be no, I'm, I, <laughs> no, Hey, I, the thing I, is, I, is, I, is, is I, <laughs> I looked at it, I looked at it, and I did it, and I'm like, yeah, oh, man, I'm really good at this. And then I'm like, oh, I don't know if I'm really good at this. You know, so I'm, my, the point yeah. is, is I'm, I'm, the data is objective, right? And we need both. We That's need right. subjectivity and we need objectivity, right? I think that sometimes people can buy uh, their own baloney, right? Mm -hmm. For lack of a better term. Yeah, yeah. I have a better term. No, and, and I love webinar. I, <laughs> I do. Well, I appreciate the objectivity of it, right? So this is something that's slightly different. Again, to go back to the original question, it's not like a, a um, um, <laughs> Thanks, Dale. I appreciate the, the, the comment, but um, it's not like a strength finder, right? This is going in and aggregating some of that data around the rep, around pipeline management, your ability to close deals, and then bringing that objectivity in a view that is, is actionable and, and digestible. So continue on, Ron. Okay. No problem. So, so defining the problem, right? You know, Gabe touched on this earlier. We have over the past five years, people are not hitting quota, and there's a lot of things that that, that are behind that. Um, you know, you, you think about some of the some of the also some of the studies that we did that we've uh, uh, have had, had access to. We didn't necessarily do them ourselves. Some of them done by CSO Insights and some other. But as we as we look at the data, you start to see that that um, sellers are 53 percent 
of the way down the buying process before they even engage with us or, or any, any seller for that matter. Um, the amount of people involved in an acquisition uh, of something has increased from 4.3 to 6.8, I believe. You know, so you, they're, they're getting more complicated. People have um, um, more initiatives that they're trying to figure out, okay, hey, how can, we, how can we best find a technology that's versatile enough to help us here, here, and here? And then, uh, you know, compound that with the average tenure of sales leadership at, at 18 months, right? That, that formula, it's like, okay, the whole buying motion is changing, yet we're still attacking it with some of the same sales modalities. And, and I think it's because, you know, sales leaders have a short tenure, so they go in and it's a, it's a money grab. And if you're doing a money grab, you're going to look for your A players, and that's who you're going to, you're going to cling to, and you're going to try to build your business around that. And, you know, there's, you know, Jack Welch has, has documented it, um, you know, with the affinity curve. It's the, you know, the 20-70-10. 20% of the population is going to produce 80% of the revenue. 70% we're pretty much going to ignore, and that bottom 10% we're going to recycle every year. And, you know, that, that's one way of looking at it. But I think there's also this ability to be able to upcycle. And, and, you know, how do you transition? And that kind of moves to that, you know, how do you transition, you know, your C's to B's, your B's to A's? Well, you have to define what the problem is within the organization. You know, define what success is, see where the gaps are, and see how you can, see how you can kind of move the needle. So that gets us into kind of assessing the team, right? We need to, we need to understand <clears> – <throat> based off of my population, based off of the opportunities I have, what does success look like? And that, that allows yeah. us to go in and, Ron, and yeah. you know. Go ahead. Let, let me ask one more question because I love some of these questions coming in. I'm trying to – I'll save some for the end. But um, great question here by Ted. Just as you jump into the assessment, maybe one contextual piece is, is an assessment like this only valuable for, um, you know, large complex organizations who have, you know, uh, intense sales cycles, long sales cycles, multi-stage sales processes, or can it be for a team that's a little more transactional, order-based, more like a you know uh, maybe a smaller shop inside sales department? How would you guide that the, uh, contextual question? That's a, that's a good question. What what I would say, it's not necessarily that, that you know uh, it's got to be complex. The sales cycle's got to be complex. Um, or lengthy by, by any stretch of the imagination, um, you can you can still get benefit from a from a transactional if you're working some kind of sales process, or there's a there's a cadence that's built out, or there's key mile markers that you know that you need to hit, um, you know to make something you know to move something through some kind of progression, you can certainly do it. If you're you know doing one call closes, I would say this is probably not for you. The sweet spot. Um, where you're really going to see the benefit of this is, you know, selling groups of, of 50 or more. Because then, then, then what happens? Because the, the reason why, since we're using data, we want to have a large enough sample size, right? To say, okay, hey, you know, we've got a lot of transactions going on here. Um, if we're going to take the notion of high tide rises all ships, you know, who's doing really well in these particular areas around building pipeline, and who's doing really well in executing that pipeline to revenue? And what are the what are the leading KPIs that drive that from an activity perspective, right? So it's, it's not always about more activity; it's about the quality of activity and right activity at the right time. If you think about it from a marketing, it's like am I talking to the right person at the right time with the right message because their view of finance is X, yes or no, yeah. right? So it's, it's it's putting up some guardrails for them. Hopefully that answered your question. I love it. No. Great answer. Yeah, Ted, let us know if that, that answers okay. the question, but I think it does. It sounds like, yeah, single call close, probably not. Anything else that kind of is working multi-stage is, is um, up, for, up for debate. Back to you, Ron. Sure. Okay, thanks. So you've got a sales team, right? And, uh, you know, if, if you look at a sales team, it's like, okay, I know that there's some diff there's, there's differences between the sales team. The assessment allows me to start to look at where people have strengths, weaknesses, opportunity for growth, uh, who are my strong closers, who are my, are my pipeline builders, um, you know, who could, I, who could I team up to mentor to bring this person that might be lagging in this area up, right? They, they, this whole, this whole uh, notion of, of taking uh, underachievers to overachievers it has a path. And so if I can understand my sales team, their strengths and weaknesses, I can start to align process and people 
around the execution of those opportunities. Uh, so th th this is great for coaching, it's great for team building, and, uh, you know, great for alignment and, and to try to create continuity within the sales process. So once you've, once you've done that assessment, you, you, you in essence segment the population. And so being able to segment the population, you know, the way that we've formulated kind of a high level is you've got your top performers, you've got your underperformers, you've got your deal makers and your pipeline builders. And, you know, some people might, oh, I want deal makers. Yeah, you want deal makers, but you don't want carcass carriers, right? Just like you want pipeline builders, but I want my pipeline builders to be able to execute opportunities all the way to closure, right? And then my underperformers, mm -hmm. you know, is it because of, is it because of tenure or is it because of position fatigue? You know, why are they underperforming? And then I have my top performers, right? They're doing a lot of stuff well. And then, you know, Gabe mentioned, you know, looking at this quarter of a quarter, you know, it, it, you also want to understand as I'm deploying these insights, you know, through our, our technology solution, you know, what's the impact? Like, you know, is this a closed loop system where I can start to understand how are they trending? Are they, are they yo-yoing back and forth? Are they overwhelmed because they've got too much to do? You know, there's a lot of, a lot yeah. of signals that get brought out, you know, as a result of that. Yeah, now we've so got a couple more questions you, coming in here, Ron. Oh, sorry, yeah, go just, ahead. Just real quick on this slide in particular, yeah. Um, is this something that's kind of a live feed in the assessment? Um, I've got Eric asking this, and he's saying, um, I mean, first of all, he said, hey, it's cool to be able to see kind of a, just a visual representation of these dots or people. And I'm paraphrasing for you, Eric. I hope it's okay. Um, but then he said, hey, um, is it something that, you know, you have like run through a rigmarole once a, once a year, like, and it takes a long time to get this assessment, or is this like a live feed that I'm watching on a TV daily or something? Well, that's a great question. So first we, we come in and do an assessment, right? And so the assessment as it sits is like, hey, we're going to go and do some analysis of the data. The reality is, is if you turn on our platform, this exists for you. So I look at it as like, hey, it's a point in truth. It's, 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 it, is, it is the truth at any point in time. Sorry. So if I wanted to go in and, uh, you know, within your Salesforce environment, you know, click on the, the inside sales tab, you know, it would take you to this and it say, hey, here's how my ecosystem looks right now. And if I wanted to click into any of those, I could actually dig down into those. So if I wanted to look at a top, who, who are my top performers or who are challenged, I could click into that panel and then it would it would tell me who those folks are and and where they're challenged, frankly, right? And then how they rank against their their peer group. So you you can get down yeah. into the into the nitty gritty of this, and it's always live. I mean, that's the the, the nice thing about a closed loop mm -hmm. system. We're conti we're continuing to monitor change. And so as their behavior changes, it's going to show and it's going to surface, you know, in, in, the, uh, in the framework of, of what it is they're doing, whether it's a, you know, a pipeline call, whether they're getting prepared for a one-on-one, -on -one, whether they're, do, they're preparing for their QBR. You know, I think that's, that's another aspect of this, right? You think about um, the level of transparency, you know, that it provides, you know, both up and down, right? Everyone understands what the expectations are because, you know, I'm challenged in this area. Now, now my manager can coach me. Uh, he can help me. Um, he can help me connect the dots where I need to connect the dots. Yeah. So a couple, a couple other questions coming in here, Ron. And again, I want to be, I don't want to dis disrupt too much, but I, I'm pretty good at that. So I'm, I'll continue. Um, you know, Ted, uh, Ted, I don't know if this is your exact question, but you've got a couple other people kind of asking, what, what, what are some of the things you mentioned a little bit on the slide before, but what are some of the things that are making up this this box? Is this just revenue numbers, or what are some of the the, the inputs that are non revenue KPIs to kind of Ted's point that are making up these kind of dots that are ultimately then people on this floor box? Right. So um, it it depends on the organization. Okay, but uh, just to give you just to give you a few off the top, and I've got a list of about. 29. Uh, I won't run through them here, but um, you know, you could look at commit accuracy. I'll take, I'll take, I'll take a couple. Right, commit accuracy. Uh, commit accuracy. You know, at a high level, it helps me to realize that um, this particular individual, if they have high commit accuracy and it's influential for us closing revenue, um, has a firm grip on how to execute through our sales motion. And I'm being generic, but but you know, that there there's a particular. Uh, one, um, and let's say let's say the other one on the top side uh, of the funnel would be uh, pipeline replenishment, 
right? So I think at pipeline replenishment or even pipeline coverage, right? I think that there's a myth, <laughs> there's a misnomer that we need 4X coverage. Uh, the reality is, is all coverage is not created equal. And, the, you know, the fact that we have the ability to, to get into the, the details of what coverage needs to look like for an individual for them to be successful is highly impactful, right? Because now we're, we're taking out that subjectivity of we need 4X coverage. Well, you know what? Bill may need, need 3.2. Uh, Sarah may need 2.1X coverage, right? Because she's, she's, got, she's got a, a better understanding of, of, you know, how to smooth out the lumpiness of her business because she's tenured. Right, so I think there's you know ten years. No, there's a no, there's a number of different, and I certainly you know we we can share in more detail kind of what we're looking for. So, but hopefully that's uh, that's helpful. No, that is. I think I, I think that's good. I think we kind of get that gist. Again, appreciate the question, guys. Keep them coming. But Ron, you can kind of go ahead and continue that. Okay. All right. I'll try to I'll try to. So I'm going to transition out of this. But yeah, it's quote attainment and sales skills. Those are the kind of if you look at the the X Y axis, right? Because ultimately we want to be able to to generate uh, revenue. So uh, some of the things that come out, and I, I probably could have just jumped into this, but right, 47% of sellers commit accuracy is below 43%. Okay, right, there could be a severe problem, uh, and around um, you know training or under, if they understand how to execute the sales process, are they a good quarterback? Do they know the resources they need to use and when? You know, there's this there's this notion of uh, understanding KPIs, and then, you know, if you use a system like uh, like ours, you know, the value over time is to establish the anatomy of a deal, right? I know that I need to do, like, for example, I know I need to be in front of the VP of sales showing him his data in our solution, right, within within six weeks of, of, of analysis. If I do, I close 83% of those deals versus 32% if I don't. So as a seller, that's like a that's a leading indicator, right? That I need to that I need to work through, um, you know, getting a better understanding of of how to work through the sales process, right? Some of the other insights that might come in: thirty nine percent of sellers struggle to replenish their pipeline. If this is a leading indicator of success, then I need to, uh, you know, figure out how to do that. You know, fortunately, like in many cases, our customers, this is a sign for us that they need to leverage um, uh, predictive playbooks. Right, they can establish a cadence. Uh, they can uh, start an outreach strategy, right, to make sure that they they create continuity in their in their communication strategy to get things going within their within their sales motion. And then the other other thing, this is something that came up that I thought was kind of cool. Seventy five sellers are underperforming in all success KPIs. <laughs> so if I was to categorize, hey, here's the top. 10 uh, KPIs that lead to success in your organization, you have 75 sellers that are under the benchmark of success. Like if I can start pulling that stuff up, I, it's, it's like the, you're only as sick as your secrets, right? So if I, you know, and Gabe talked about turn the lights on. Hey, if I can turn the lights on and start moving people's behavior in a positive direction, it's going to lead to revenue. Right, and that's what we you know we did we did a study and just it just ended in August, and it was with six out six thousand sellers over a million transactions, and you know we took the approach of just hey let's just turn the lights on and see if we can move the proverbial seventy percent, and so so we did so we you know it was like before our solution they turned the solution on, and then what we saw was a fifteen percent increase of the folks in the middle seventy percent moving into the, the adjacent quadrant, right? So not not saying everybody was you know was a 15% all the way to quota, but you brought you brought people that may have been you know 45 or 65% of quota to 85% of quota. So you can do some basic math. Anybody that's on the phone and realize okay that's that's real. Those are real dollars, right? And you can multiply that by the number of sellers you have. You know this starts making a lot of sense. This approach is incredibly effective. Right, because it, it goes down to a managing activity. Right, I'm not saying hey, you need to be, do better. I, I say, hey, here's what here's what good looks like in our organization. You know, how can I help you get there? So, when you look at it from a from a quadrant perspective, right, you want to look at it and say, okay, hey, you know, here's here's what this segment is. Right, so we've we've looked at the, the organ we've looked at the organization, we broke it down, and then we're saying, hey, here's some of the the attributes that, that these folks possess in this particular quadrant. 
and it gives you a percentage of your reps. So not only do you say, hey, here's a, here's a systemic issue that we have, but I can isolate it. And if I can isolate it, I can address it, which, you know, that's for me, that's good. And then you say, okay, hey, in this particular one, 9% of my reps are, you know, pipeline builders. Okay, maybe that's not a huge, maybe not a huge challenge, but, you know, Let's look under the covers and see what's really going on within this organization, right? And then you see 53% of your are, are people are, are focused on deals. Okay, well, now this is alarming because if I look at this organization, I've got a bunch of people that are not developing pipe. So if it's an enterprise deal or if it's an enterprise company that's got a little bit longer sales cycle, I'm about to come up on some lumpy times. And if I'm a, an organization that, that has a shorter uh, sales cycle, maybe I – have people that don't necessarily know how to qualify, right? They don't know how to lose early, and they're dragging these. You know, this is kind of gets back into that carcass carriers, and you know. So I want to be able to inspect that. The nice thing is, is, is the assessment kind of it breaks it down. So it says, okay, hey, here's here are the areas that you need to you need to take a look at. Hopefully that makes sense to, to everybody. And then you have your kind of your all star reps, right? They're they're the best of breed in both categories. Um, this is where you can start to build your models from. Right, and like I said, I don't want to do a purple squirrel model, but I, I do want to do a model of success, you know, and, and what, are, what, are the, what are the leading indicators for these, and then, and then you know, you build a model. The nice thing is this all is, is done by our technology, so, you know, makes it makes it a little bit more simple. Was that, oh, that, was that clear as mine? Um, <laughs> you know, I, everything but the purple squirrel on that, uh, Ron. So, I, yeah. um, Man, if I, can, if I can use that in, every time I talk, it just makes me smile. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know, I know, it, I know. It. Well, sorry, sorry, um, man. No, I'm I simple. Was, I'm simple. That was very clear, Ron. <laughs> you know, to be able to kind of go through and understand that assessment, I want to just put kind of the cherry on top, just in the last few minutes that we have here, um, and talk about once you take this, once you've got this kind of data, this kind of light on experience, how can you build a little bit of a structure around it, just to make sure that you action it and flow it through your organization. Um, so that you get some things that look, you know, a little more like this, where we're actually taking our right. performers on the bottom and, and putting them on top. And two things that we, we come in and recommend strongly is going to be kind of this concept of people, systems, and process, right? So one is on the system side, um, we have, if you are low at building pipeline, we have a pipeline tool it's called Predictive Playbooks, and it allows you to build systematically in a more succinct manner, your pipeline so the people who are low there can kind of double down on that aspect. On the flip side, if you're having a hard time managing your pipe, managing opportunities and forecasts, kind of figuring out how to manage the deal flow more appropriately, that's where our predictive pipeline tool comes in and helps those sellers navigate those some of those, those rough ties. So a technology application can absolutely kind of take you to the next level. Now, on top of that, and again, this is always where people, systems, and processes come into play, you want to have a strong sales management cadence. And I don't want to dwell on this too long, but you want to be thinking through, I've got the data now. How do I, how do I put my arms around it and make sure there's a cadence to use it? So um, you may do your annual business reviews or a semi-annual, real formal four-box performance assessment quarterly business reviews, you know, monthly kind of team sessions or, or biweekly or weekly individual or skill-based training sessions. You want to have some sort of cadence to be able to wrap around this and, and tighten it and use it effectively. And I, I'll double-click on a couple of these. Won't spend a lot of time again if you need some follow-up questions, by all means. Ron and I will be offended if you don't grab this on LinkedIn and continue the conversation. But um, a great forecast system. We're going to give these sellers – a real insight into their pipeline and how opportunities are moving. But you don't have an ability, if a manager's not sitting down and, and, and talking to the rep about it and it doesn't roll up to the executive team and you've got a structured cadence for your forecast planning, then this, this data is not going to be as useful. And so you've got kind of a, a sample plan here of saying, okay, hey, let's have our, our reps on, on, say, a Wednesday sit down and look at kind of their commit and what they're looking in their pipeline. And then let's start to roll that up to managers and VPs. And then by the end of the week, we've got a full scale um, forecast meeting that kind of looks at the entire organization. And 
uh, a tool like our predictive pipeline with a great forecast cadence, it just becomes um, extremely powerful. Now, on top of that, um, is this idea of kind of skills and training. As Ron was alluding to, you know, it's like, hey, um, we, we've, we've got this data, you're sitting down, you know what good looks like, and we can, we can actually coach you to get there. Do you have a way to do that? Are your people actually sitting down and talking in a consistent manner? You know, I, 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 I'm a big sports guy, I love it. One of the things that all great sports people have is they, they've got a coach, they've got someone who's mentoring or helping and sitting down and helping them kind of think through the data and making sure they see kind of that vision and then the tactical steps to get there. And so um, big recommendation on, on creating a skills-based program. This is a sample we found to be uh, very effective. You know, week over week, taking a sit down with the team and going through some of the data and, and reviewing a case study um, and maybe doing a role play within your team. And again, sometimes you got bigger teams or smaller teams, but finding a structured way that makes sure those team meetings um, get some skill in there so that people do know how to maybe double down and get a little extra pipeline or double down and, and, and do a little better on this skill of, of commit so that we can ultimately get to our goal of, of hitting quota. And then last but not least here, um, just these individual coaching sessions. Um, I like this kind of model of facts, meetings, feelings, and action where you, when you sit down with this individual and you've got kind of this data in front of you, you can see it on the right-hand side there, um, you review it with that person, right? Review some of these key performance indicators and get the context behind it. Do stay positive. I love the three-to-one rule. Anytime you do an individual coaching session, focus on the celebration. Get the three positive aspects and then get the one area of improvement and then follow that up with some strong recommendations on what specific skills, leading indicators we're going to focus on in order to get that deal moving or the pipeline built so that you can ultimately get to that goal of, of more code attainment. So um, those are, and again, way more context that we could share with on, on that, you guys, but I know the holiday season, some of us are getting ready to take vacation here in just a day. So I wanted to touch on and make sure you realize that greatness is always people systems process. Um, so for those of you who want to take uh, the next step, who want to experience a little bit further down this journey of rep assessment or understanding where you are, we've got two options for you. Then I'll take some questions. Um, number one is what we call our pipeline benchmark. It's a very short three or four question survey. You just go in and you, you put in some of your numbers and we're going to benchmark you against a couple thousand companies just to see how well your pipeline is performing. Activities, number of opportunities, close rate, etc. The fun thing, there's a, a little uh, uh, link you can click to be able to action that in your resources. Take it, we'll get some data back to you and it's a nice way to just say, hey, let's take one more step down this path and see how I'm doing against some of the world's best. Now, for those of you who want to take a bigger step and like this concept of the sales effectiveness quadrant and some of the pieces that Ron talked about in the four box and underperformers and tops and pipeline builders, for those of you who fit the right profile, jump in, click that link, um, raise your hand, we'll follow up and we'll walk you through free of charge. Um, I mean, I don't know the price tag on this, Ron, but it, I know it takes a little bit of time and it, it, uh, it's probably it's, it's worth some, a nice chunk of change, but we're offering it free of charge um, during this webinar. Click on that, fill it out, we'll follow up with you, and we'll walk you through this exercise, turn the lights on, what's going on with your bottom performers and what you need to do to get them to, to top performers. So um, I'm going to leave this up again. Click the link if you'd like to take the next step. Um, but certainly we appreciate you joining. And if you have any questions for Ron, I know there's a couple here. Our time's a little short. We'll answer those and then we'll excuse ourselves for, uh, for the break and, and wish everybody a happy new year. A um, couple questions, Ron, that came in. One from Marlena. Um, when you say... Um, uh, when you say lose early, are you referring or saying that this person does not qualify um, or don't waste time? Or what do you mean by losing early? 
Well, I think <clears throat> so. For me, losing early is to I, I want to disqualify them. You know, I, I'm paranoid, right? I, I think like that. Uh, you know, why won't this deal win, or why is this a good opportunity? You know, lo- losing early means ask a lot of questions to ensure that you you have um, you know uh, either budget, you have the authority, need, timing, whatever you whatever methodology you use. Make sure you hit that up close. You don't want to drag deals around just to fill your pipeline. Because what happens is you, you, you get caught up in wasting cycles in time explaining things that are not going to happen. So if you can lose early, yeah. it's better for everybody, right? I'm not wasting time, resources, energy. You know, I'm being honest with myself. I, I think, I mean, sales is, is, you know, the one place if you're honest with yourself, you'll be successful. And so, you know, lo- uh. lo- losing early you know, that's that's what that is about. Huh. Um, yeah, that's an interesting thought. One, one you got to probably watch kind of a uh, fine line there. Um, Nick saying, hey, I'm having trouble getting the link. It's on the right-hand side there, uh, Nick, in the, the side window for both the pipeline assessments and uh, the sales effect in this quadrant. If you can't get it, Nick, just hit me on LinkedIn. I'll make sure we get you taken care of. A um, couple other questions here. Um, you know, you mentioned the four. <laughs> I didn't want to bring this up because I thought it sidetracked us quite a bit, Ron. So I'm, I'm doing it now for those of the, who want to jump. They don't have to listen to this. But uh, 4X pipeline, you know, you hear about it. You hear people saying, hey, um, we got to have it. It's something that, uh, um, you know, it's a standard. We need to do it. You, you, you touched on it a little bit, but we had a couple people say, wait a minute, shouldn't you have? always have at least 4X pipeline. Can you just kind of reiterate your thoughts on that and what the data is saying? Not what people think or have thought, I think, over the past 100 years, but what the data is saying. (laughs) Yeah. Um, You know, I think think that if you're going to beat a drum and say you want 4X coverage, that's probably okay. But if you're a sales leader, I want to know what really I need, what what do I really need, right? Because what what, what happens to me as a sales leader I get fired for two things, surprising the executive staff and missing my number. That's why you have an 18-month <laughs> tenure. Okay. So, uh, you know, I want to know what really is going on. I, I may I may tell them, hey, we need 4X, but what the data is telling us, and I say us, you know, Gabe and I, you know, are involved in different studies. It, you know, all coverage isn't created equal. You know, so, some people are much more uh, effective and efficient on executing um, or walking through a deal. Or quarterbacking a deal, uh, you know. Some some people have half years, right? Um, some people uh, struggle executing, uh, asking very difficult questions, and uh, and you know they may need more coverage because they're not going to press the way it needs to be pressed in order to get a deal done. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, you, you, yeah, you look at you look at different people, you know, like different people. Yeah, I mean, this you know, it's what is it? If I and it's not like hey, I'm not telling you like over the last quarter. I'm saying I'm gonna look at maybe the next over the past year, or you know, the past four quarters, or the past six quarters, you know, or what's the what's their because it's gonna change in some areas, right? The marketplace yes. is gonna change. Yeah. So if I look at it running running four yeah. quarters, you know, what have they done historically? What's their commit accuracy? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Do you feel and like? And, um, and, 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 sorry. Yeah, go on, I was going to say. I was going to say. I was going to say. So many other questions. <laughs> I just think the the one other thing is like if you if you think about over over time, if you're if you're able to have a time machine and go back and see what your environment looked like last year, and and how did you know what was the the coverage of Gabe last year, uh, this quarter last time? Did he hit his number? Yeah, he did, and he had 2.2. Let's look at the quarter after that. Yeah, he had 2.1. How about the one after that? He had 2.4, right? So obviously if I go back and look at time, right, which, you know, you obviously with our technology you have the ability to do that, I can start to understand what does my coverage really need to look like. And that way I'm not having people cycle on doing a bunch of cold calling or, or uh, yeah. they're, not, they're not doing a bunch of ninjutsu around something that's not going to be – you know, helping them generate revenue because salespeople are coin operated. It's like, you know, help me, help guide me to what is going to be the easiest path to, to revenue. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, we still are corn operators, whether we like it or not. Last question, then I'll wrap this up. Um, I mean, there's others, and guys, again, we'll be offended if you don't grab us on LinkedIn, Gabe Larson, Ron Hollis. Let's continue the conversation. Happy to debate and discuss how to build these teams, put in these programs, get this technology up and going. Because, again, it, it, it's all the answer is always going to be kind of people, systems, process. I don't think you can just do a coaching program and not have kind of a way to visualize it. Don't think you can just buy a tool and it's going to kind of save the day. So get, get all these pieces in one way or another, and I promise you you'll see better results. Last but not least here, Ron, a um, couple of people ch- not challenging you but saying, hey, man, sounds like Ron's a data guy. What um what what is one of the most predictive points data points that lead to kind of quota attainment or somebody being an all star is is there something out there that um, is it the number of activities they do every day is it their um, ability to to create you know a thousand opportunities a day but what's kind of the the piece that you found oh interesting this is one of the more predictive elements if you're if you're going to have kind of a superstar on the team. It's it's com- it's commit accuracy. Are you closing the deals hmm. that you forecast and commit quarter over quarter? Interesting. Interesting. Simple. Simple and to the point. A lot of commit accuracy. Well, um, let's let's stop there, Ron. So much more to talk about, guys. Thanks so much for the questions. Happy holidays again for myself, Ron, and the InsideSales.com family. Do connect yeah, with thanks us. Thanks for having We'd me. Love to continue to talk, um, Ron. Again, appreciate you joining. Yeah, thanks for having me, Gabe. Happy holidays. And for everybody else, again, happy holidays and have a fantastic day.